Copyright University of Auckland, all rights reserved. The content and delivery of lectures in this course are protected by copyright. Material belonging to others may have been used in these lectures and copied by and solely for the educational purposes of the university under licence. You may record the lectures for the purposes of private study or research, but you may not sell, alter or further reproduce or distribute any part of these lectures to any other person. Failure to comply with the terms of this warning may expose you to legal action for copyright infringement by the copyright owner and or disciplinary action by the university. Good afternoon everyone and thank you for coming along today. It's a um, real privilege to be here to talk to you. It's always an honour for me to represent the Growing Up in New Zealand study. Um, it's a project that I love working with because together with 7,000 7, families and children, um, as Jesse said, we are learning what makes a childhood in New Zealand happy and healthy, as well as what makes one difficult, unfair or complicated. So we're here to talk about brains. I called my, my, I called my talk, It Takes a Society to Develop a Brain. I don't have a background in, in brain science at all, but I hope I can tell you some of the things that we're doing at Growing Up in New Zealand to try and understand how children's brains develop um, and what that means for our wider society. I love this saying, it takes a village to raise a child, because I think it encompasses perfectly the idea that there is no such thing as a single influence or a single experience or a single story that defines a child's life or a child's development or indeed any one of our adult lives. Rather, we are multi-layered, complicated, complex beings defined by many different stories and experiences that have woven their way through our lives. I spent a little bit of time researching the origin of this phrase. It's commonly reported as an African proverb. In actual fact, there are many sayings in many languages and cultures that can be translated to mean something along these lines. Whilst I was researching, I came across a significantly more cynical version it made me laugh at first. It had been a long day at work. Um, but as I carried on with my tasks, it stuck with me. Because in all honesty, isn't this really how life feels at times? As a society, we need to make sure that everybody knows where their village is and how to get there. We must provide the support, the policies, and the infrastructure to make this possible. That is our social responsibility, and at Growing Up in New Zealand, we hope to collect the evidence that will make this happen. It seems evident, evident to me that it really does take a society to build a brain. And I've, I've decorated this slide. I started off wanting to fill it with images that described New Zealand society. And I was looking for pictures of towns and, and cities and landscapes. And I realised that we have an astounding um, collection of large things, mostly representing food items in New Zealand. There's even a Wikipedia page. <laughs> that describes New Zealand's list of big things. And these are the photos from that page. I think some of them may um, face some revision um, in light of the government's new obesity and children strategy. <laughs> Through this talk, I want to tell you about the purpose of growing up in New Zealand, where it began, and the things that make it unique. I hope you will learn about the ways that growing up in New Zealand I have my children here, they're doing really well, <laughs> and I hope they last for the entire talk. I hope you'll learn about the ways Growing Up in New Zealand is trying to describe all the influences that contribute to healthy brain development in children. I want to tell you about the things we are measuring and why, because unless we measure and describe the reality of family life in New Zealand, we won't have a way to understand what changes are needed or how to make them happen. I'm also going to tell you about some of the things we've already learned and about what we have planned for the future. So some interesting things about brains. I admit to doing a little bit of research on brains before writing this talk. I don't know um, very much about the development of, of brains from a biological perspective. The brain is the only organ that's not fully formed at birth. And more than 90% of brain development occurs during the first five years of life, with something like 700 neural connections being formed every second. That sounds like hard work to me. These early connections form the basis of neuroplasticity, which underlies a child's physical and mental well-being, lifelong capacity to learn, adapt to change and develop resilience. 
Apparently, at three years of age, a child's brain is twice as active as an adult brain. No surprise to me as a parent. It's a common occurrence that I can't keep up with my preschooler. So what influences healthy brain development during these early years? What makes us who we are? These, this is the fundamental question that growing up in New Zealand is trying to answer. Certainly we know that biology, or genes, have a big effect. When I was a university student studying biology, the topic of nature versus nurture was a big debate. I think it is clear that we understand now that it's not nature versus nurture, nature or nurture. It is not even nature and nurture, but rather it is nature with nurture, with constant interactions between the environment and the blueprint that has been provided by nature. Good nutrition is another thing that contributes to healthy brain development, and you'll hear Claire, I don't know if she's here yet, Claire Wall speaking, um, next speaker in this session about the way food um, contributes to healthy brains. More than half our daily nutrients go to, go to the brain in those early years, and poor nutrition can have lasting negative effects, which can be hard to bounce back from in later life. Other things that are important, warm, caring interactions with parents and family members to stimulate the brain, strengthening a child's ability to learn. A warm and safe house, good quality education, especially in early childhood, sleep and physical activity. A community that promotes a sense of belonging. These are some of the layers of influence in a child's brain development. Not only do we know that there are multiple influences on the brain as it develops, but that, that these influences change and accumulate and interact over time. A wonderful thing about a longitudinal study is that it follows the same group of people over a period of time so we can assess these multiple influences and multiple points in time, and that's what we aim to do at Growing Up in New Zealand. The information we collect from families is centred on the child and collected to determine information about these different influences on child development. And at multiple points in time, rather than as a single cross-sectional measure or snapshot. So the children and growing up in New Zealand are turning six or seven at the moment. We send every child in the cohort a birthday card every year. But the story of growing up in New Zealand began in 2004, when the New Zealand government called for a new longitudinal study. We've had some great longitudinal studies in New Zealand. The Dunedin study and the Christchurch study have been extremely productive and informative over the last 40 years. But of course, New Zealand has changed significantly um, during that time. So why are we here? Well, things do change. You might remember some of these things. Once upon a time we had one dollar notes, a game called Pac-Man, which is still the only computer game I've ever mastered, cassette tapes to record our music on, and cell phones the size of bricks. Now we have one, and computers that looked um, not like the ones we have today, now we have $1 coins, a thing called Minecraft. I have no hope of mastering that. And gadgets that, that manage both our music and our communications. Laptops. With so much change, it was time to update what we know about the realities of childhood and family life in New Zealand. New Zealand should be a great place to raise children. And in fact, for many families, it is exactly that. Lots of families in our cohort told us that they may move to New Zealand specifically to have a better place to raise their children. But we also have some embarrassing and shameful statistics. Amongst 30 OECD countries, our child and healthy, child health and safety records put us at 29th, second to worst. We have an atrocious rate of childhood infectious disease, higher than other developed countries and getting worse. A larger than average percentage of children growing up in relative po poverty. We've got to do better for our children. We need to collect the evidence required to influence policy change so that all New Zealand families have the support that they need to raise their children and to have the best possible brain development and the best possible outcomes in life. So the purpose of growing up in New Zealand is to provide robust and relevant evidence to inform policy related to children and families in the 21st century. With this evidence, we hope to bridge the gap that exists between real life and politics at times. We hope to provide a resource that's valuable to all New Zealanders, especially researchers, politicians and the children taking part in their families. 
So growing up in New Zealand was officially launched at the beginning of 2009. We recruited pregnant women with a due date between April 2009 and March 2010, and who were residents within the Waikato, Counties Manukau and Auckland District Health Boards. This region was chosen because it contains more than a third of all New Zealand births and contains the diversity in ethnicity and socio-economic status, as well as urban and rural areas, that we needed to get um, general reflection of the New Zealand population. Of course, the children in some cases have moved away from those regions. We keep in touch with them and follow them wherever they are in New Zealand and in fact the world and there's several hundred of the grown up New Zealand children now living overseas or outside these recruitment areas. We try and visit all the New Zealand children when we do face to face interviews and our international children um, we interview via Skype if, if, if we can. <coughs> So we've based our framework on, on the understanding that there are multiple layers to child development, as we talked about a few minutes ago. Um, and we try to collect information from every one of these layers, starting from the child itself and then moving outwards through their immediate family, their informal society, the wider, broader, more formal society and the commu uh, broader community. And we collect that information at multiple points in time. As an example, not related to brain development, but as an example of policy development, one of the pieces of evidence that we were able to provide through going up in New Zealand was that private rental homes are much less likely to have working smoke alarms than, than privately owned homes or state-owned homes. We talked about this in the media, and then later in the year, of course, there were other conversations going on as well. Uh, it was announced by the Honourable Nick Smith that smoke alarms would become compulsory in rental homes um, from this year. So what are we doing at the moment? If thing, and if things have changed, what does childhood look like in New Zealand today? And in the next few slides, I'd like to show you a few examples of information that we've collected that describe New Zealand childhood um, from each of those layers of influence that we've talked about. We've known that we're a multicultural society for some time, but what the collective voices of growing up in New Zealand are telling us is just how diverse our cultural identity is. More than 40% of the growing up in New Zealand children identify with more than one ethnicity. A third of these identify with three or more. Four in 10 children in New Zealand understand two or more languages by the age of two. 8% of them understand three or more. As mentioned, our health report card could use some improvement. We face two larger burden amongst our children, particularly for respiratory infections and skin infections. 40% of the cohort had experienced one or more of these by the time they were two years old. In this slide, you can also see some other key health statistics. On average, children saw their GP six times in their second year of life. Their favorite first food was banana. 20% or more had had one or more hospital stays. And 86% were reported by their parents to be in good or excellent health. I think our view of what defines a family and what defines a household has probably changed in the last 30 or 40 years. One in five children in grown up New Zealand cohort live with extended family. Six percent live with adults who are non-related, so non-related kin, like flatmates or boarders. So too, in some ways, have our parenting practices changed, especially in terms of the need for many families to balance, myself included, balancing work and family commitments and the pressure of seemingly ever-increasing living expenses. As you can see here, large proportions of parents feel that they are a good or better than average parent. But an important group acknowledge that they have some trouble being a parent. And we need to look at ways that we can support all the families in New Zealand to achieve the best possible outcomes for their children. We've also made some measures of, of some parenting attitudes, for example, 65% of parents let their children take a risk if there's no major threat to the child's safety. We hear a lot in the media about the increasing amount of screen time that our children are exposed to. But as you can see here, other positive interactions that are great for brain development are also common for New Zealand children today. And this is a, a probably too uh, busy looking um, graph to put on a PowerPoint slide, but it describes on the left hand um, block, 
the um, uh, frequency with which mums and dads play, mu play musical instruments with their, with their children, and I should define what partner means. It, it might not be a dad, it might not be a partner, it's the, it's the parent, the other parent that the mother has defined during her pregnancy as uh, that child's um, significant other parent. So we've described here about the frequency each week of playing with musical instruments, telling stories and reading books. And you can see that for lots of children um, in the light blue and the purple bars on the right hand side are having those experiences with their parents, so parent and child interactions um, every day or several times a day. Early childhood education also a critical part of our ch children's early brain development. And we're making lots of measures within Growing Up in New Zealand about the quality of the early childhood experiences that children receive, as well as their participation, including parents' perception of quality and the way in which families and early childhood centres interact with their early childhood education <coughs> centres and carers. And this graph shows uh, the way in which early child care participation for the cohort changed in the early months of life. The top part is bar describing the situation at nine months, where 65% <coughs> of the children at nine months of age were not in any regular child care, but 35% of the children were attending some kind of regular formal child care. And then by two years of age, half of the children who weren't in regular child care at nine months still weren't but half of them were now in, in early childhood education. And 80% of the ones who were in early childhood ed education at nine months still were at two years. And so this slide hints somewhat at the change that we can measure when we follow the same group of people over time, in that um, there can be some dynamic movement in and out of groups of attendance for things like early childhood education. <coughs> Sometimes life, unfairly, is more complex than it should be. This diagram for me is a little bit like, uh, in a trivial way, getting around Auckland in the traffic. <laughs> like getting here this morning, actually. <laughs> I know I only want to go from point A to point B, and I plan out a route before I leave. Seems easy. What could possibly go wrong? Yet somehow, due to <coughs> surprise roadworks, road closures or incidents, I find myself on a much more complex route, running late, checking my map again, um, and being frustrated at the, at the roadblocks that are in the way. Despite our best attempts at planning, we really don't know what is around the corner and sometimes life can become very complicated or stressful. And we know that stress can have a big impact on brain development and the work that we have done looking at social disadvantage has shown measurable effects on health in terms of infections and reduced immunisations and behaviour. And this, this slide is a snapshot out of a uh, report that we did last year on child vulnerability that shows that children who have experienced a consistently high uh, social disadvantage or vulnerable state um, in their life have, are more likely to experience chest infections in those early years. They're less likely to have completed their immunisations. They're more likely to have behavioural problems. So those slides have shown you a little bit about what we're doing within Growing Up in New Zealand to describe early childhood and to describe all of the influences um, amongst all of the layers that influence brain development in the first few years of life. And so I'd like to turn now to a few examples of what we're currently doing or hoping to work on in the coming um, weeks, months and years. One example is to look at the way in which ear infections impact on brain development. We know that ear infections are common for young children and we know that they have effects that are much broader than simply the health implications um, that they are easily linked to. For example, they can influence child behaviour, temperament, interactions with parents and other people around, their learning and cognition and we're hoping to be studying this in, in some detail in the coming years. We also want to look at some of the naturally occurring variations that happen in brain development. And this graph shows the number of children who at four and a half years of age were reported by their parents to have a number of, or any one of, a number of 
developmental conditions or delays or um, other things. So you can see that we've got in the cohort more than 800 children who have been referred for hearing problems, around just under 600 with vision, uh, 800 or so with potential speech problems, around 400 um, who have been described by their parents to have uh, behavioural problems, and these were things that had been confirmed by medical um, by the medical community. Just over 100 children on the um, ASD um, area, 200 with learning difficulties, and in the uh, 100 to 200 who have um, difficulties with physical development, growth, movement or mobility. And so to summarise what we talked about, it takes multiple layers of influence on brain development to develop a healthy brain in the early childhood years. And at Growing Up in New Zealand, we're trying to collect information for all of these layers of influence. We've talked a little bit about what childhood in New Zealand looks like today and about what happens when life is more complicated and the impact that that can have on health and behaviour. And we've just mentioned other natural variations that occur in brain development during the early years. For me, working with growing up in New Zealand is an incredibly humbling experience, particularly as a parent, because every day I'm, I'm made aware about how, li how complex life can be, and for some families, very difficult. It's certainly a job worth getting out of bed for, and I hope that the work that we're doing growing up in New Zealand um, has become something to be proud of and something for the participants to be proud of as well. I'd like to end there um, and allow time for questions and discussion but just to acknowledge that Growing Up in New Zealand is a study led by the University of Auckland um, and to acknowledge the participants that, that provide us with their time and their busy schedules to answer our questionnaires, which can sometimes be long. Um, and Susan Morton is pictured here with some of those participants. Um, those photos were taken, that photo was taken sometime last year um, when the participants uh, were, were just starting school, I think. And we're very grateful for all of the participants um, and for sharing the information that they give us that helps us build a good picture of New Zealand childhood. And since it's a Saturday and I've got my children here, I'd also like to acknowledge them. Um, my preschooler, Emily, uh, asked me recently when she would get to meet my work children. <laughs> and my 10-year-old um, told me that my presentation would be much more cool if I did this. <laughs> So there's a picture of them, and their brains certainly do amaze me every day. Um, if you have any questions or discussion points, I'd be very happy to um, entertain them.